First of all, my name's George Luck Jr. I'm Vice President of the Kingston Historical Society, and I want to welcome you to the tour, um, Inns and Taverns. If that's not what you signed up for, then you're at the wrong place. Um, but so we, we tried this last year, it got hot, and we had to cancel or postpone, stop it in the middle of the tour. And then thanks to Mr. Marcus McParland over here, uh, who is doing his eighth grade community service project, and he chose to do it on um, the village of Kingston and some of the, the history of it. So he's been pulling out all kinds of newspaper articles, and now we found out about a few more taverns and inns that we did not know about. So I don't know whether I should thank you or, or not, because now it, it has expanded our process. And he has a, he's going to be publishing a book shortly as part of that class. So um, when it's available, it'll be posted on the Historical Society's website. And I encourage people, how many pages? 600 and some pages. <laughs> Most, mostly, mostly newspaper articles taken from anywhere from the 1800s on to present day, I guess. So a lot of, lot of interesting things there. And I also would invite anybody that's available on June 3rd. The Presbyterian Church is celebrating their 300th anniversary this year. Um, and so on June 3rd, Reverend Charles Dixon and I will be giving a, a presentation in the sanctuary about the history uh, from 1723 forward. And the Historical Society is hosting a reception downstairs at 6 o'clock. Um, for little snacks and get together before we go up to the sanctuary and learn about the history. So that's at 6 p.m. The talk will begin at 7. So if you're interested in that, no reservations needed for that because uh, we have plenty of space. So with that said, we'll get started on the tour. Inns and taverns have been an important part of American history and American culture since the beginning, since before the founding of our nation. So Kingston has had them since 1683. So we will discuss most of them. Some of them uh, buildings still exist. Some of them are gone and some of them are here, but not taverns anymore or inns. The thing about inns and taverns in early days is that they were a gathering place. If you wanted to get news, find out what was happening in the area or in the country, you went to a tavern and that's where you would find your news. There would, there would be newspapers there. You would, uh, legal notices would be posted, a uh, place to talk politics. And uh, so they, they served a multiple, yes. Women could go to taverns. It was mostly men, but women women were welcome to go. But um, mostly men were mostly men traveled. All right, so uh, so that's that's what basically would be happening. But you know, it, anybody would could travel, and of course, local people would get their news uh, from the tavern, and a lot of times male, sometimes judicial. Uh, hearings were held in these taverns so a lot happened location was probably the most important part of a taverns being in success because in colonial times right up into the 1800s actually the county set the rates so if you wanted a glass of wine the county said how much it was and each tavern would have to sell it for the same price so there was no you know, I'll go down there because they have, you know, five o'clock special or something. Everything was the same. Uh, same thing with your meals. Same thing for the oats and the hay for the horses. So it was regulated by the county. They posted it annually, and that's what you had to go by. So what you had was either your service, how clean of a place you had, and, of course, for Kingston in particular, it's location because... We are located halfway between New York and Philadelphia. So this was the main road. It was the post highway. 
it was a king's highway because it was so wide it had to be certain width in order to be considered a king's highway route 27 as it's known today was that so this was the most popular we are in somerset county right now but in a few more minutes we'll be in middlesex county and eventually if you want to take the whole walk you'll be in mercer county because Kingston is the only village in the state of New Jersey that's located in three counties. All right, so it's unique in that way too. So this was a good location to have a tavern because horses would stop here and, and you can't go from Philadelphia to New York in one day. It usually was early on about a three day journey. You could maybe do it in two if you really pushed, but this is a, uh, the uh, area that uh, was right in the middle. So this was a popular place to stop. Yes. They did. We'll you talk about. Yeah, they would. They would come through here. Some would stop, and and we will talk a little bit about that later. Yes. yes. What was the first known record of this road as a, as it was described? Well, the first known would have been with the Native Americans because it was a Native American trail. So it goes back into the 1600s because uh, the Lenny Lenape Indians were in this area and this was their normal trail because they were kind of nomadic and they would work this way to get down to the, uh, well, to the Delaware River actually to do fishing in the summer and all. So this, this trail has been here for a while. John Adams, when he traveled, it said it was his final uh, road as he ever trod, uh, and that's in recorded in his uh, diary. So, this was the the most direct and best road to take as you went to uh, Philadelphia from New England or New York. So, the first um, tavern what we'll talk about is actually what we call Little Rocky Hill now, and it was the uh, Pine Tree Hotel. But they listed themselves as Kingston, and you have to go a mile and a half, two miles outside of town on the left-hand side. It does not exist anymore. Um, and that was mostly the early 1900s up through the 1950s. And it just had uh, picnic groves. They would have, uh, the, the firehouse used to have fights, boxing fights, uh, matches as, as part of their fundraising. And you, uh, the, the Pine Tree Hotel actually would put out tickets and say you could have a free spaghetti dinner or a free brought first and a sauerkraut dinner with that ticket if you went up to the hotel tavern after the uh, fight. So that they, they started around the 19, early 1920s and they were in operation until the 1950s. In fact, uh, the other thing about the pine tree is that the son of the owners, uh, who was a member of the fire company, he's actually the only member of the Kingston Fire Department that was killed in action in World War II. Um, so he, he was a bartender at his father and mother's establishment. And then we come down to the next uh, place that would be a tavern in Kingston was known as the Whistle Inn. That is currently uh, well, it was prior to that even, Jedediah Higgins' home. So at the corner of Raymond Road and Route 27, uh, which is now a spa, was the uh, the Whistle Inn. That was owned by uh, retired police officers out of uh, New York City. And um, I'll let you read the articles in Marcus's book when that comes out, because we won't get into all the details, but there's a lot of a lot of interesting things that happened there, and a lot of times the police were called for fights, and and sometimes there were fights between that inn and the next inn, which is the Golf Inn, which is uh, where New Dawn is now. And I can give you, let's see, the actual address is uh, 4513 Route 27. Again, on the Franklin side, that's owned by a re was owned by a retired Franklin Township police officer. So the New York cops and the Franklin cops, I guess, didn't see eye to eye all the time. So you, there's newspaper articles where they're fighting back and forth. Um, but that was, uh, again, had a dance pavilion out back. Um, 
They had uh, gas pumps at one time for the motoring public, and they sold baskets, um, food baskets, invited you to come down for a picnic lunch, and uh, those kind of things. They, uh, I don't think they really had it as an inn where people stayed. It was more a place to go eat and, and drink and, uh, and party. One thing I'll tell you about the Whistle Inn, I know at one point they were uh, shut down for illegal gaming. They had some kind of slot machine. So, And that's a, a kind of a theme that will go through a lot of these taverns and, and hotels in Kingston, especially during Prohibition, because you're not legally allowed to be selling alcohol. And so sometimes they did illegally. And, and so they had to come up with other things that would be interesting to get people into, especially the men into the bar. And so they started doing uh, slot machines and uh, gambling and all, which also was not legal. So the, the uh, feds would come and uh, shut them down or the state would come and shut them down. The next place we'll just talk about is not an inn, but where the new school for music is on the corner of um, Shaw Drive and, and Main Street or Route 27, just past that, there's a little gully. That used to be a pond. Um, it was known as Shaw's Pond, but it was a pond early on. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get to one of the other stops, but it, it's just down the street here um, that was uh, good for fishing. So across the street, the green building behind it, because you can't see it now, was in the Revolutionary Era, the Beehive Inn. Now, it's the legend said that uh, George Washington ate there several times. I have not found any documentation of that, but it's just like saying George Washington slept here. He did sleep in Rockingham, um, but... It's, it's one of those things that people, you know, you own a piece of property and you know Washington was in the area, you take credit and say he ate at my inn. We can't find any documentation of that, but we do know it was an inn and we, uh, it stopped being recorded sometime around 1734. Um, so, or not 1734, I'm sorry, 1834. We didn't have any further record of that is existing as an inn so probably at that point became a single family home um but he was here before the battle of prince well <clears throat> right he he tr retreated through kingston on the way across from fort when fort lee and fort washington fell he encamps outside of kingston but that's a whole different story at the revolutionary war but he does come through Kingston. The troops march through on the way to the other side of the Delaware and then back into Kingston. But we are going to have eventually another tour on the revolution. So if you're interested in the revolution in particular, I'll actually put all my colonial clothing and we'll do a revolutionary war tour. But it won't be during the summer. <laughs> it'll be spring or fall since it's all authentic and it'll be how Kingston interacted or during the Revolutionary War. But that's not scheduled yet. Okay. My wife's saying not to do it at all. So okay. we're gonna continue on down to the next stop so that we can talk about a couple of the other hotels, taverns and inns. So we'll try to talk over the traffic, but I wanted to stop here because across the street where PJ's Pancake House is, was the sign of the mermaid. That was uh, the proprietor was William Van Tilburg. He op opened that building in 1744. All right, and he had it was on one acre of land. It had four large rooms downstairs, and then there was a full basement. It had a large hay barracks and a large barn and stable and that's obviously for those that are traveling and spending the night they had to have a place to keep their horses so he um in 1754 in front of the front doors 
he built, uh, had a, a large well built. And uh, that becomes the first source of fresh water in the village, unless you want to walk down to the Millstone River to get your water. And you'll see in a few minutes, and, and it's much easier now, Route 27 in the hill, than it was in the 1700s. So that's some hike to go get water to bring it back up to, to your home or, or tavern. So it cost him in 1754, seven, approximately $700, equates to around fifty-four, $55,000 today. Um, and maybe you couldn't do it for that today, knowing that you have to brick line it and everything else. But that was the first source of water. Uh, the post riders exchanging mail stopped at this end. This is where the rider comes from Philadelphia. This is where the mail stops. Comes from New York. This is where the mail stops. They exchange, go back to their respective cities. Um, the fourth, the second floor, and on, on the first floor, four corner fireplaces. So there were fireplaces, four fireplaces downstairs upstairs there's four rooms again with fireplaces windows had bench seats each room had approximately five or six beds know that in colonial days you don't get a separate room there's no privacy as far as that goes i guess if you have enough money you might be able to get privacy and sometimes tavern keepers, innkeepers were known to give up their own um, accommodations if, if a family or a husband and wife were traveling together. But generally it's men and you get a piece of the bed. So if you want to get to sleep early, get up there early because when the bed's full, you're on the floor. So, you know, you want to, you want to retire early. And the earlier the better because if you're in the middle of the bed, at least for one, you're going to keep warmer. And number two, you're going to have a bed to sleep on. Uh, so in 1783, I, I think it was October, Lisa, do you know for sure? But George Washington is at Rockingham, and he has some sick troops. Uh, some of his sick, some of his lifeguards get ill. And it's determined that they need to put them inside and get them off the ground because they're not in the mansion because Washington, his family, and his, his aides are inside, but the uh, lifeguard are outside in tents and on the wet and cold ground. So they want to get them healthy. So what they do is they uh, take over a room or two for those that are sick. Uh, I am sure that uh, Mr. Van Tilburg will take care of them because his um, he has three sons that fought during the revolution with with the militia, Middlesex County Militia, um, 3rd Regiment. In fact, his youngest, uh, Peter, is only 12 years old when he enlists. And he's, uh, his father had to sign permission for him to join. And he's a, a drummer, a drum, drummer boy in the 3rd Militia. And then by the end of the war, because he serves the whole time, he uh, musters out as a drum major. So. I am sure Mr. Van Tilburg is uh, very accommodating. The other thing that family legend said, and I've talked to families of the Van Tilburgs, and they're asking me the question, um, but they had heard that there was a portrait of George Washington that hung in the tavern, but on the reverse side was a portrait of King George III. Uh, and depending on who was in town, what portrait showed, um, I don't believe that for a moment. For one, you're taking an awful chance, especially if it's the British, because if they come in and they turn that picture around and find Washington on the other side, this building burnt down. <laughs> so I, I doubt that. And I, he was a patriot, so I do not think that he would have had King George in there. In fact, during the revolution, he puts in claims for damages caused by the British Army. Um, they stole parts of the four corners of the globe, uh, maps and, and things of that sort, and probably some uh, some drinks and everything. So they he did put in uh, damages uh, for that. 
the inn stays in business until the mid 1800s. William Van Tilburg dies in 1804, but uh, the the inn stays in business until about the mid 1800s. Uh, we know that it was a, a very high end inn. Um, fed, uh, the local governors used to like to stop here and stay here, and federal senators when they were traveling, especially when Princeton wasn't big enough to hold everybody, but this was a, a favorite rendezvous place for federal senators. So, uh, and his will at the end, when they, they took inventory, fine linen table covers, um, fine china and Madeira and imported rum and all those things that would lead you to know that this was a, a higher end establishment and not just something on the side of the road where you, you would go in and get a drink or whatever. So his inventory showed a lot of upper class type furnishings um, when he passed away. The building eventually came into complete disrepair. And so in the 1880s, it was dismantled. And uh, what's here now was built on the, on the foundation, but uh, that is not the original building. There's very few original buildings that you're going to see today. Um, so that's, that's the Van Tilburg Inn. Before I talk about this building, in 1834, when this tavern and this tavern were in operation, we have recorded history that says there were 49 stages and 400 harnessed horses here at one time. Um, stopping at the inn, either for dinner or for staying before travel, continuing on. Uh, Stagecoaches would stop here. In fact, this building was the, known as the tavern, well, this site was known as the tavern house. Phineas Withington comes to Kingston in 1810, and he builds a tavern here. Now, I pointed out Shaw's Pond to you earlier. Phineas Withington has a pond built on his property. That where the new school of music is, was Withington property. And that pond was fed by a fresh spring that if you follow it, would go up into Trap Rock Industries property. He dammed that off and at one time, and you would never know it today, you could take a rowboat out into that. You can, in fact, they would fish in rowboats, boats, and in the winter time when it iced up, there was a lot of ice skating done on that pond. You can't do it today because it's all overgrown and it hasn't been maintained. But he stocked that with fresh trout and other fish, fresh fish, country fish, so that he could feed his travelers fresh fish right out of the pond. So there wasn't getting them sent down in ice somehow from New York or Philadelphia or even Princeton. He had his own fish pond. So when you had fish in this establishment, you had fresh fish. This property was about six acres at the time. Um, so Phineas, I think he dies in 1834. And then uh, a Gulick, uh also takes over with him. Uh, let me get the right name, Henry Gulick. They have the Union Line Stage Company that's running a stage through to go to New York and Philadelphia, Ulick and uh, Withington. So that's how this becomes known as the Union Line Hotel. It was the Union. It was a stage depot uh, for the Union Line Stage Company. And I will give you a quote out of uh, the papers from before um, the stage was. It's quoted as, it was a this place, it was as fine a tavern as could be found in East Jersey, known to travelers between Philadelphia and New York as the place to change horses for the stage and to the public generally as one of the most eligible in the country. So again, we have two of the best taverns in that were recorded in New Jersey. And this was East Jersey at the time. Uh, and I guess, for those who have heard different writings and even through Washington and all that they were traveling through the Jerseys 
because it was East, Jer East New Jersey, West New Jersey, uh, by the Keith Line, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so they promoted the stage line here. Uh, travelers would come. And then this place goes into different ownership. I mean, uh, John Van Tilburg, related to William Van Tilburg, takes over the property around 1834. Uh, and then Theodore Titus in 1865. And then in 1879, the building is destroyed by a fire. Uh, at that time, they rebuild it on the same foundation. And the, uh, the Goring, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Goring take the property over and still have um, a tavern and an inn. This is that building. It is basically also on the same foundation. And if we were able to get into the basement, you could see the Dutch ovens that are downstairs for baking. Where you folks are standing at one time was the kitchen. And um, Mr. David Potts, who is a trustee emeritus of the Kingston Historical Society, did an archeological dig here before the Momo brothers took over the property and, and blacktopped everything. And if you dig down about 12 inches, you will find the char line from where the fire went. Um, and, and that's true in any fire. If you know there's been a fire somewhere and a building destroyed, if it's below ground and you dig, because obviously the ground's constantly turning, um, but 12 inches below, you'll find about four to six inches of char. The dirt still has the char in it to show you where the fire burnt down to. And in the back of the building, when we dug where the basement entrance is, he found the cobblestone sidewalk that led up to the building, uh, which is now under pavement, so we can't dig it back up and show it to you, but the cobblestone still exists behind here. And he found all kinds of artifacts when he did his digging here. We found, uh, he found, not we, he found a King George II half penny from 1754, I believe it was. He found a Henry Clay for president coin pin. Um, found all kinds of uh, little bits of uh, clay pipes, the remainder of them. Of course, colonial days, a lot of times they gave you clay pipes and then you smoked and then when you're done, you just broke it off and left it for the next person to smoke until it got down to a stub and then it was the end of the pipe. Um, found pen knives, you found straight razors, thimbles, um, and all kinds of bottles and china. So um, again, they're not on display, but the Historical Society has them in display cases, but the Lock Tender's house isn't all that big. And we don't want to put it out on public display without somebody being there because we would end up unfortunately losing it. There's what? Van Dilberg is Dutch. There were some Dutch. There were some English. It was a. It, this town was pretty much a mixture. This is kind of, as far as the Dutch came and, and English. And, right. So, and I, I will tell you. Let's see more about this place. Um, I guess in 1939, um, Effie and Jim O'Donnell own it, and they're the last owners of this as a tavern. It, uh, and they still had rooms to rent, but the, the rooms upstairs then actually became more like an apartment thing. It was still just a room, but they were more permanent housing. It was not... Uh, an inn like you would stop for the night and, or a couple of days and move on. It became more permanent. Uh, but this, uh, let's see, I'll describe the property. In t 1921, it, this was a 17-room building. So there was two or three rooms on the first floor, and then the upper room was all rooms that were for rent, um, both in the 20s still for tourists and, and travelers. Uh, it had a 
several barns in the back. It had an ice shed, hay barracks, other sheds. So this was a pretty prominent place um, at that time. They, they advertised their specialty in the 20s was steak sandwiches. And, and one of the advertisements they had was on Tuesday evenings, and this is 1937 now, uh, they had uh, Zeke's Fiddlers and a Hawaiian orchestra every evening, and then they uh, had the steak sandwiches. So that, that's what they were advertising back in the, uh, in the 20s. Uh, let's see. And then the only other thing is, that I would say is that afterwards, right now it's Witherspoon Media. This is owned by uh, the Momo Brothers, T2 Enterprises, who own Enoterra, and along with Mediterra in Princeton and Witherspoon Bread Company. I don't know all the places. Teresa's, I think. When was the excavation held? Ooh, when did we do that? Um, I would say we. I, I helped him with that. It was, yeah, probably about 20 years ago. He had it set up out back, and he had the whole, I mean, we did digging in this. What was the question? When, when was the excavation done? Oh. And it, it was definitely less than 25 years ago, because this building was ready to fall down in 1999, and the Momos restored it and, and fixed it up. These are bankers in 1679 was the, the Dutch first, first recorded from here walking down there. so as that goes um, th that's pr probably pretty much that on this tavern um, does anybody have any questions about Van Tilburg's sign of the mermaid or or this place this also had a name of Kingston house at one time so one of the owners called it the Kingston house but originally tavern house and to this day, as locals still call it the Union Line Hotel. I will say that it did have a bar on this end, and had and it had a separate entrance for women, because women could not come into the bar in the bar area. They would have to go into the dining room area because it wasn't felt that it would be proper for a lady to come into a bar. So ladies could drink, but they were expected to drink in the dining room. So times have changed on that too. A a any questions on uh, this this building? Yes, Vicky. The railroads, yeah, because the railroad came through Kingston at one time. Matter of fact, you're down near where the railroad was, right? <laughs> Yeah, and the original train station was on nursery property down there when it was mostly passenger going from New Brunswick well, to Philadelphia Trenton. Down by where the lock was. Yeah. Well, that was the second train station, yeah, and that was passenger also along with freight, and that extended into Rocky Hill, but mostly for the quarry and for the uh, terracotta factory. So. Uh, I would think the stage is probably 1840s, maybe stopped coming through. Um, and, and don't forget they had the straight turnpike by then, Route 1, which would, and that's kind of why some of the stuff was developed to try to get people back into Kingston and Princeton because they were, all the businesses were suffering. Right. Absolutely. Yes. In the Bridgetown book, they talk about people coming from Bridgetown to Houston Saturday night for Sun of Yeah, where would they be now? Probably our next stop. Or possibly here, because this was here. By then, this is gone. This, this ends up being a grocery store, and now it's PJ, so it's had different things, but uh, it wasn't a restaurant until recently. No. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's why it was interesting to see 49 stages and 400 harnessed horses because both of these were, it was still in its heyday on the downside, and this was in its heyday 
on the upside at, at one time. So we're going to go down to right in front of Palace of Asia on this side of the road. We're going to talk first about the building, the uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it, brown? Yeah, the house. That's the original building. That is was Cornelius Van Dyne's home back in the 1800s. And uh, it was just a home. In fact, one of the interesting things about Van Dyne, it's got nothing to do with taverns and inns, but his son, Marcus, where are you at? What's his son's name that served in three wars? John? John Van Dyne was a doctor. He served in the Civil War, Spanish-American War, and World War I. So he served in all three wars, ended up in... Uh, outside around Syracuse, New York. He was born in that house. So Van Dyne's eventually sell it. Now, we, we know it as Brooks Manor, the section behind there, but Brooks doesn't come into Kingston until around 1928. And the Van Dyne's are out of here early 1900s. So we're trying to still piece together some of the history of that building. We do know that there was a Spence Hotel that was very popular, at least in 1917 and 1918, thanks to Marcus. It was supposedly the biggest building in Kingston. And when you look at that, that's a fairly large building. So it, we kind of believe that that might have been where the Spence Hotel was. Um, but he's only recorded in 1917 and 1918 but it's supposedly a real hopping place where everybody came and everybody knew about it. But we're just starting to try to get information on Edward Stent. So I really can't tell you much more about that. When Brooks, yes, S-T-E-N-C-E. -E. Yes, S-T-E-N-C-E. -E. No. No, that building is currently the Palace of Asia. The upstairs is just offices and all, but that's all part of that complex. It's all connected, yeah, yeah. So Brooks comes in 1928, and it's mostly a candy store and restaurant. And for those that know American history, 1928 is in the middle of prohibition, so you're not selling alcohol, supposedly. Um, so we have, you have to sell other things. But he does advertise in 1928 for having, it's a tourist hotel for people to stop, restaurant, so they have fine dining minus the alcohol. However, the taverns are affected in 1917 and 1918. And they're not allowed to sell, sell alcohol then. Does anybody know the history of why they wouldn't be able to sell alcohol in 1917 or 18? Well, it wasn't the fuel. This is it. That, yeah, that's Brooks Manor. Um, World War II. World War I. That's right. I'm, I'm really jumping ahead. World War I. And... Um, in Princeton, New Jersey, is a flight school for the armed forces. And they're teaching pilots how to fly. And the federal government puts out an edict that within a five mile radius of the flight school, they cannot sell alcohol. And Kingston <laughs> fell within that five mile radius of wherever that airfield was. Now from here to the center of Princeton is three miles. So I, it could have been just the other side of Princeton for that matter. But they were not allowed to sell. In fact, Joseph Catelli's bottling company, who didn't bottle beer at all, they bottled soda, but they were not able to operate because they distributed beer. So any distribution of alcohol in 17 and 18 was forbidden. And some small, smart entrepreneur in Kingston decided to rent a bus and take people to New Brunswick so that the people wouldn't lose out on drinking. 
uh, during 1917 and 1918. So there's always money to be made somewhere. Um, so Brooks, interesting story on John Brooks. He comes, his wife is the postmistress for a while, but he starts his business here and um, he's from Georgia and he has a sixth grade education. He had stopped school at the end of sixth grade and he comes up here and he runs this, this business very successfully. A lot of different banquets. There's a report once of a venison dinner where 40 people came from surrounding towns and they made North Brunswick and Jamesburg and Rocky Hill and Griggstown and Princeton and Kingston all to come and have a venison dinner. He, he advertises in uh, 1937 on Tuesday evenings. I guess he was in competition with uh, Union Line. Tuesday evenings, they had the Hawaiian group uh, playing Zeke's Fiddlers and all that. Um, well, no, actually, Zeke's Fiddlers is here. That's the Hawaiian orchestra down at the uh, Van Tilburg's, I mean, at the uh, Union Line. And then uh, he says they have, uh, uh, what did he say? A hot colored band on uh, 19... 37. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, so he advertises that. Dine and uh, Dance, 1934, actually, so it's even more recent. So, 1934, uh, 1948 was the Venison Dinner. They always advertise Good Eats. In 1952, it transfers from Brooks Manor to, uh, the Millstone Inn. So it's the Millstone Inn. Still operates the same way. Obviously, there's alcohol back uh, because prohibition has ended. So they're they're drinking and they're having parties. Um, and uh, then in 19, let me get the right year, 1969, Good Time Charlie's opens here. Some of you may remember Good Time Charlie's. So Good Time Charlie's. Everything stays the same all the way through the Millstone Inn until Good Time Charlie's comes. They're the ones that add a banquet room to the front and a dining room to the side. And then eventually they take the uh, original bar and they move it to an, an addition, another addition to the back section where they have another bigger banquet room. And they, they stay in business until 2004. 2004... Um, Charlie Browns comes in, and then after that, uh, the folks that own it now uh, take ownership. I'll get you the year on that. Uh, 2012. So Charlie's is here until 2004. Charlie Browns goes from 2004 to 2012. And then the Pind, which is village, I think, in one of the Indian languages, uh, India, India, not to be confused with Native Americans. Um, and then they've changed the name to the Palace of Asia. Uh, so they still run banquets. I understand the sports bar is now closed. So it's just, I think they're just doing dinners and, and banquets in there now. But all the addition around the original Van Dyne house was done by Good Time Charlie. So, uh, and Yes. Yeah, if you go inside, you're in parts of the Van Dyne house. Absolutely. No. No. <laughs> yeah, you really can't. You can tell by some of the architecture, and if you go down the basement, you'll know you're in the original basement, because uh, that hasn't changed. Right. Yeah, you can only see it. I was just checking to look at our Google Maps and you can see how the house has just completely been surrounded. Yeah, all four sides. There's not one side that you can go to right now, unless you go out on the roof and then you can go up against the wall on all sides. But So we'll go down to Kingston Garage parking lot. We'll talk across from the post office.
So across the street where the post office is, was in 1850s, the, the Fisher and Warford Hotel. So again, you, you have to envision back in the day, a lot of travelers came through this village and stop here um, in different taverns and inns and hotels. So it must have been a busy place. It was later known as the Stagecoach Inn, the Old Heath Tavern, and by 1878, it's owned by Thomas Neary. And so, um, and an interesting thing in 1878, little off the subject, but April 2nd, evangelist Miss Lizzie Sharp comes and she preaches here. They, the folks at Kingston had heard her talk in Rocky Hill, and they were interested in starting a Methodist church. Um, and so they had them come to Neary's Tavern, Neary's Inn, and uh, there are two large rooms downstairs. The crowd filled both rooms and the hallway while Miss Lizzie Sharp spoke. Her text was, God is our refuge and strength, a very help present help in trouble and many were filled with the Holy Spirit and that's when they decided to start the Kingston United Methodist Church which is down Church Street Church Street not named for the Methodist Church but for the Presbyterian Church that once was located in the cemetery so people think Church Street is named after the Methodist Church it was actually named after the Presbyterian Church because the church was in that cemetery in 1723. Well, I don't know for sure 1723. I wasn't here. We know for sure in 1766 it was in there because the maps we have show the meeting house in the, the cemetery. And there is a marker in there explaining where that is. And for those in the revolutionary thing, quick aside, that's where the famous, famous conference on horseback was held. It was in the cemetery following the Battle of Princeton when Washington decides that he's going to go to Morristown because the troops are just too beat up. They've been under arms for 72 hours, fought two battles. They're not fresh enough to go to Brunswick, which is where the British had their stores and, and treasury. That was the game plan. It didn't work. So they retire up eventually to Morristown. But... <laughs> Presbyterian Church was in there. Um, Pastor Charles Dixon. I was going to say, October 14th, put it on your calendars. That Saturday, you're going to be able to watch the seminar. Yeah. Because it's going to be a Methodist Church Sunday. Yeah. And then the next Sunday, we're going to have the Methodist Church And hopefully, hopefully in period outfits, so you'll re re meet people from the revolution on up into the 2000s. So, that is the building, but not when it was in its heyday. This is almost when it's torn down, and at the time this picture is taken, this was known as the Beehive Inn not associated with the original Beehive Inn that we saw across from the Presbyterian Church. This got its name as the Beehive from locals, because it might have still been known as the Heath Tavern for all I know, but the locals called it a Beehive because it was very transient. And people would come and go, and it was like a beehive of people yeah. in and out. Correct. No, correct. So, yeah, no, this... It's just in the same location. Same location, but this, this definitely is... This was known as the Beehive, but it's not officially. Yeah, but the Beehive we talked about that had the actual name Beehive was across from the Presbyterian Church. Uh, late 1800s? Yeah, probably late 1800s. No. This building was built in 1960, 1966. Because I remember that because I was a Boy Scout that raised the flag for the first time at the post office. Now I'm really aging myself. Um, and it had 50 stars still. So. I'm not that old. <laughs> not quite that old. Um, so, but 
What's oh, that? Down there. Oh, down there. Oh, yeah. All right. So we're ready to head down to the bottom of the hill where there was a lot of activity also because by that time there's not the stage coaches and the horses and wagons going as much as canal traffic and railroad traffic. So we got to cross here and we're going to go all the way down to Enoterra. We'll concentrate first across the street and that um, empty lot, there used to, you can see where the train tracks were right this side of the bridge. You can see the lock tender's house. So the lock, the, the, the canal goes right here. So these there was a hotel here and it was very popular um, for uh, many years, especially when the, when the canal was in its heyday. Uh, and we're talking, there, there was definitely a place here by 1860 and it was known as the, uh, the Franklin House. Sometime after that, it becomes known. Well, I, I guess the, the Franklin House is like 1860 to 1900. And it, it again, is just a place to stop, a hotel for people to stop um, if they're uh, traveling. But it also helps for the canal because much like Kingston is the halfway point between New York and Philadelphia along the, post, the old post road old post road post road just like people refer to the old whistle in no old is an adjective it was the whistle in but it was old this was the post road and a king's highway the canal kingston is the midway point of the dnr canal from bordentown to new brunswick in fact construction of the canal started here in kingston this is where they first started digging the canal just down the canal a little ways going towards Princeton was a turning basin. It's still kind of there, but not as large as it was. And it actually had docks where they could tie up at night. God bless you. And so sometimes you just don't want to sleep on your barge anymore. So you come to a inn and get a, and by then you get your bed to yourself, I believe. So you don't have to worry about sharing, but, uh, you could get an actual room and relax a little bit instead of sleeping on the barge. But even if you want to sleep on your barge or your boat, you sure can get a drink and relax for the evening, get a you know, steak or whatever they're serving, fish, and, and have a good, good dinner. So it's the uh, Franklin House until, 18, until almost 1900. One thing about the Franklin House, there's a murder in Princeton in 1862 of a Princeton jeweler, and I have to look all this up, James Rowan was the jeweler, and I think he was cased by this Mr. Charles Lewis. Well, it becomes a sensational trial of the century, like we always have trials of the century. That was a trial of the century, um, trying to pin the murder on this Charles Rowan. He stayed in this hotel. He stayed in this hotel prior to going in and committing the murder. And then he comes back to this hotel and then he goes up the canal back to Millstone. So all the evidence and everything, they, they took evidence from the room and I don't know all about the forensics, but this plays a prominent part in the trial. So 1900, Daniel Hoffman takes ownership of the building and there's pictures there's, first, there's a picture of the canal area with the uh, post bridge that would have been pulled up, not the swing bridge. They've had two different type bridges here in Kingston. But you'll see it. This building existed. It was Thomas Fisk Grocer. So in the early 1900s, this was Thomas Fisk Grocer in the hotels across the street. That was a grocery store. Were they in the business at the same time? This was earlier oh, than okay. that. Okay. And there were, there, for a good part, until malls started, and the Acme's and the ShopRites and the Pathmark started coming around, P 
people got their groceries in local grocery stores. And this village always had at least two grocery stores where you could go get your canned goods, fresh, you know, meat, um, bread, milk, all that stuff. Um, and that was what this was. All right. It was Fisk, then it was Feldman. Um, I'll tell you more of that history if they don't come out. So Hoffman has the place. And maybe they won't want to come out. Um, and um, the bar and grill there w was known as Tannhauser. Hoffman is German, of German descent. So there's a lot of that that goes into it. A lot of times they, they're having, much like Pine Tree had Brock first and sauerkraut, a lot of German food, a lot of German beer and drinking. Uh, that building burns down in 1910. Uh, devastating fire takes it completely down. Hoffman rebuilds in the same area. I won't say it's the same foundation, um, but you can see pictures of the Hoffman Ho Hotel, Hoffman House, and the train. You know, at times, it looks like you could reach out and maybe put a mail bag out and let them collect the mail from you. That's how close the train would go to the. Uh, the hotel and so it was um, burned down 1910 he rebuilds and he now calls it the Kingston Hotel and instead of the Tannhauser he has the Rat Skeller which is basically German for beer garden and that was downstairs um, again just a place for locals to stop so it had good food um, and, and folks would come here for dinners, and travelers would stop here overnight. So if they're taking the Lincoln Highway, which is now in existence, right, 1911, 11 or 13, the Lincoln Highway. 13? Yeah, 1913, the Lincoln Highway from New York, right, Manhattan, lower Manhattan, to San Francisco. First transcontinental continental road in the in the United States so it wasn't much of a road when you got out west it was pretty much a dirt trail rocky trail but here it was was good dirt and in fact I think it might have become macadam by then so uh, this was one of the stops that's why we have gas stations inns and taverns again because the cars in those days, uh, in fact, uh, I was told that Jimmy Potts' father, Wilbur, used to do vegetable stands. He used to grow vegetables and take them to New Brunswick to sell, and it was a four-tire trip. And what he meant by that is he would have four flats between here and New Brunswick that he'd have to get out, pump it up, and patch it. So the roads, Adams might have said it was the finest he ever trod, might not have been the finest you ever drove because that's how he referred to the trip to New Brunswick as a four tire trip. Any idea when this was made? I believe it was the late teens or early 20s um, that they, they finally paid this. And this was the road, right? This here was the road. Yes. And then rerouted? Yeah, for the new bridge because this always floods. Yeah, 1960-something. Those were gas pumps, but I, they were shell shell gas. And then the top of the hill, the Kingston Garage had XO, well, SO. No, it was actually when I started driving, 22 cents a gallon. So... <laughs> No, no, that was always across the street. All right, so they get shut down. They get padlocked uh, in 1929 for violation of prohibition. And there's a couple places that had that, like I said earlier, either illegal gaming or illegal selling of alcohol. And they would get shut down. Um, so, again, I would encourage you to look for Marcus's book, because if you want to hear the dirt, I told him he finally had to go try to find some nice stories about Kingston because he was finding all the murders and the suicides and 
and the robberies, is, because that's what makes the paper. You know, you, you don't get good news, right? Nobody tells you when, you know, well, actually, we do have when the canal opened. That, that was good news and things of that sort. But unfortunately, newspapers always want to bring you the bad news, the gloom and doom. So th that book's going to have a lot of that. And then, but there are good things when people were successful doing things, whether it was gardening or farming or whatever. It, it, it's going to be a wealth of knowledge that is coming. So, but I guess it's like the internet. You only believe so much of what you read, even in the newspapers. But it, it's it's well reported. Robert or um, Robert, are they? Do I talk about this? Oh, we can go in. All right. So, does anybody have any questions about across the street? Again, the canal makes a big difference in the establishments down here. The um, I will tell you, the Kingston Hotel burns down December 21st. Is it? Yes, December 21st, 1944. And then there's nothing here. All right. After that. It's just kind of empty. Now it's just the Flemmer Preserve, and it's a, a park, Franklin Township Park, um, in co which coincides with the state park, the Del Delaware and Raritan Canal State Park. So it, it's all parkland. Parking is there, but there is no uh, no hotels. Mercer County, we haven't reached it yet. I want to think... I was married. Well, I got married '71, so maybe it might have been right before that or right right after that. I, I do remember when it went in. They said it will never flood, and the Giants and Eagles used to play a JC Classic at Palmer Stadium when there was a Palmer Stadium, um, and it got flooded out, and the traffic was backed up as far as you could see because it was one lane trying to get across. And I think by the time people got across, the game was over. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, so this does flood occasionally. Route one is early on. I mean, it's 1800s, 1804. That was early. So yeah, it was the straight turnpike. Yeah, it was the straight turnpike. And that's why a lot of the, the business people of Princeton and Kingston, Raymond Road was built to get people off the straight turnpike to come into the two villages so that people would still have business. So they, they kind of, but it was a toll road. So I don't know why you would get off a, a free road to come on a toll road just to visit Kingston and Princeton, but there were amenities here. You could buy groceries. You could buy food of any sort. There was clothing stores. There was, you know, entertainment. So, Maybe that's the draw. How, how did the seminary affect the ferry of Princeton? Which, which, which Princeton Theological or oh, St. Saint Joseph's? St. Joseph's. Saint Joseph's College um, or seminary was a Catholic school for trying to develop priesthood. And, and so it was like a high school. I don't know other than they would have to walk and every Sunday afternoon or was it Saturday I can't remember probably not Sunday they would have to walk in there and they had white shirts and dark pants and they would walk down out to Harrison Street up into Princeton up into Kingston and that was an every weekly thing uh, but these are high school kids so I don't think it affected the economy that much in the village because they kind of stayed on their campus except for the weekly walk they had to do Well, they would, or would buy food to bring it in. That that started around 1910 or 1911, I think. The seminary is 1913. 13. So, <clears throat> again, but they would either buy or grow on their property. So they were pretty self-sufficient. Any other questions about this? So we're going to go inside Enoterra. And we'll let them talk about that, and you can get in probably to the air conditioning for a few minutes. All right, and then there's one more 
in we can talk about when we come out. Or, or actually, let me talk about that. And that way, if people want to have something to eat or drink, and then they could, they want to make their way back up the hill, they can. The lock tender's house is open. It has a dis two, two displays. We try to keep current displays. One wall has taverns and inns. Talks about licensing. Um, you had to be of good, reputable character. I didn't tell you that. You had to petition, and you had to have people sign a petition saying that you're a good person to run the tavern. Uh, so there's a display on the taverns and, and some of the taverns in Kingston and then some in general about inns and taverns of colonial days. The other side is devoted to the church for its 300th anniversary. So those are the two displays that are up in the lock tender's house. That is open every Saturday and Sunday, at least from 10, usually earlier, until 4, and usually later, but 10 to 4, you can depend on that being open. <laughs> this is still this is still Middlesex County. We're still in we're in Middlesex, and right over there in that green area is Somerset. And across, when you get about, well, if you could judge where halfway through the, the river is, you'll get into Mercer County. <laughs> Yeah, this road here. And if you go down this road, we won't walk because you can't see the tavern anyway. But you can drive past it. The Gulick Homestead now was Greenland's Tavern. 1683, 1685. If you're coming from this way, going towards Princeton and Trenton and Philadelphia, it's a good place to dry off. It's a good place to start dry, but you're going to get wet coming across because there's no bridge across the millstone until 1704. But Kingston is a good place under normal conditions to ford the river. But they built the bridge in 1704. They replaced that in the early, eight, um, well, they replaced it with a bridge that had stone. So it was stone and planking. So on January 3rd, 1777, when Washington crosses, and he goes up by the church, the church that's not there anymore, in the cemetery, and has this conference on horseback, he orders the Corps of Engineers to come down and destroy the bridge because the British are going to be following him. If you stand in the cemetery, you can't see anything right now because it's all trees. Be mindful that in 1776, 1777, first of all, it's winter, but second of all, there's no trees. There is nothing. You have a clear shot to look towards Princeton because the trees were taken down to build housing, firewood, what it cleared the land so they could farm because this was a farming area. New Jersey is the garden state because of back in the revolution, this was the breadbasket of the colonies. This, we grew everything, and even the Hessian soldiers and the British soldiers would comment in their diaries of how good the food and the grain and everything else was in New Jersey. So this colony was the breadbasket. There's no Lake Carnegie, no. It's just, it's just the road and the river. That's all you have here is a river and a road. All right, so... The, that tavern, Greenland's Tavern, 1685, is the Keith line. George Keith surveys North Jersey to South Jersey. We talk East Jersey, the finest inn in East Jersey. That's when that line is decided. I think that's the um, Province Line Road is the one that he has. There's been different surveys done, East Jersey, West Jersey. But when you hear people talk about, I travel through the Jerseys, that's what they're meaning. It's New Jersey, the colony of New Jersey, separated East Jersey and West Jersey. So let's go into Enoter. I'll be around for any questions. If you want to walk down into the canal, Lock Tender's house, you're welcome to do that. You can go down onto the bridge, uh, 1787, I think that bridge is. And it, it actually has a plaque on there that tells you how many miles to New York. How many miles to Philadelphia? Oh, New York, Philadelphia. Let me get it right. Yes, Bishop.